Welcome to The Access. I'm your host, Heidi Buzo. In this episode, we'll be discussing the Syria Hanukkah Festival in Washington, D.C., cooperation between Jewish activists and Syrians, and the role American Jewish organizations play in helping Syrian refugees. To talk about all of this, we are joined by Franz Ephraim Katsir, founding director of Sephardic Heritage International, D.C., and Shlomo Boltz, Policy and Advocacy Officer at the Syrian American Council and the co-founder of Jews for Human Rights in Syria. Thank you so much, Ephraim and Shlomo, uh, for coming on today. I've been trying to get Shlomo on for a while. Um, and obviously, it's a great you know, work that you guys are doing with the uh, um, Hanukkah, uh, Sephardic Hanukkah celebration, especially when it comes to the Syrian Jewish community. Um, Tell me a little bit more about this event and, uh, you know, who is it, whose idea was it, basically, to start the celebration on a yearly basis? Uh, so, uh, I, you know, had this idea to, to do this program and, like, this is the, this program is what brought together uh, people on the Sephardic Heritage International DC or Shin DC board, including Shlomo, um, Leila Levy, and Violet Batat, and myself. Um, you know, this is what brought us together as you know, Sephardic Heritage International DC. And the, the perp we connect to this program you know, because most of us have. Uh, heritage, um, Syrian Jewish heritage, and that to begin with. And also, we saw the situation in Syria, um, and so the chief Sephardic, one of the chief Sephardic rabbis called the situation there uh, a small holocaust and said that the world, um, you know, many people in the world remain silent during the Holocaust, and he said that we should not be silent today um, regarding what's going on in Syria, um, particularly as, as Jews. And we wanted to be able to do something. And so we began this program to raise awareness of ways that people can help Syrian refugees. Um, and is also, it's based on a Syrian Hanukkah custom, um, which well, it's based on a Syrian Hanukkah custom that was initiated by Sephardic refugees from, from Spain who found safety or security and tolerance in Aleppo. Uh, the story goes that after they were expelled from Spain, so after 1492, they were on Mediterranean Sea, and they thought they were going to die, as many of the refu Syrian refugees of today um, shared some of the, a similar experience. And so they, it was during Hanukkah, and they, ar when they arrived in Syria, they went to, to Halab um, and joined with the, the Jews who were already there, called the Mustarabi mm -hmm. um, community. And they initiated this custom to light an extra flame each night of Hanukkah to remember the safety and tolerance that they found in Halab at that time. Mm -hmm. so you put all of these things together, uh, this is the, the basis for this program, that what we, we learn from that extra flame and also through the, the connection that we have um, to Syria and wanting to be able to do something um, to help in some way. Mm -hmm. That was put beautifully. Uh, and, you know, this is something that, um, I mean, I want to kind of, you know, raise attention that you, you have a, a Syrian Jewish grandmother, right? Correct. And Shlomo, you also have one of your grandparents yeah, is Jewish. Also a grandmother. Yeah. Jewish from Aleppo? Yeah, from Aleppo. From Aleppo, because Aleppo was the, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, Correct, Jewish communities yeah. in Syria. Yeah. Right. Um, Shlomo, you've been very active on the Syrian issue from the beginning, pro the Syrian revolution. Yeah. I know you personally, uh, you know, we've worked together, we've been in meetings together with uh, people in the administration. You really helped a lot. But what got you involved 
from the beginning, I kind of want to go back a little bit to how you started becoming involved as uh, an American a Jewish uh, guy, but you know, you have just one grandparent or gra grandmother from Aleppo. So it was, uh, <clears throat> it was a uh, slow and uh, gradual awakening. Uh, one thing to note about the American Jewish community, unlike uh, the Israeli Jewish community, most Jews uh, in America, uh, they fled from Europe uh, during the Holocaust, some of them even before. Uh, whereas most Jews from Israel, uh, they came from the Arab world uh, more in the 1950s or the 1960s. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. I grew up, uh, like most American Jews, in a kind of European Jewish Ashkenazi environment. Uh, so they didn't uh, put an emphasis on uh, Sephardic culture. Uh, everyone in my school which uh, especially my, element, my uh, elementary and middle school was very uh, high and rigorous uh, Judaic studies, uh, mm -hmm. was uh, done in the Ashkenazi way. Yes. Uh, so it was only really as I got older in high school uh, and college that I started to become aware that uh, there was something different about me even small things, you know, like uh, I like the really spicy foods and others, uh, they couldn't stand that, uh, the things that we ate. The, That's very Aleppo, by the way. Yeah. Okay, and I'm covered there. Yeah. Uh, the pronunciations, the way I pronounced the prayers were a little different. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I started to look more into this. I started talking to my grandfather about, uh, grandmother about this. One thing I really remember uh, very well uh, because it was our last meeting is uh, in uh, 2008, I believe, before I went uh, to spend a summer in Israel, I started asking my grandmother uh, about Syria. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, uh, yes, uh, it was very difficult to get into Syria, given the tensions in those times. I did manage to travel to uh, Aleppo on my Syrian passport. She did. Yes. She went back. She did go back, mm -hmm. and uh, my cousin as well uh, also went back briefly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what year was when they returned to Aleppo? Uh, it was uh, maybe the sixties or seventies. Mm -hmm. uh, she went back only for a trip, uh, and then went uh, back home to the United States. To the United States my yes. cousin, the same thing, a brief trip, and then went back uh, in uh, late two thousands. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Even though we were born in the U.S., raised in the U.S., it was uh, set up in my family that, uh, you know, Syria is something that's still a part of us. Even mm -hmm. though we're not there, it doesn't mean that we've uh, forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was set up in my mind, uh, especially that last conversation. She said, I went to uh, the souk in Aleppo. Mm -hmm. It was so beautiful. I've never seen anything like it. That's, uh, that's something I remembered. That's something that stuck that with me. That resonated with you. Yeah, it resonated with me. Uh, and it was the last thing she said uh, uh, practically to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, really, she said it with a lot of feeling. So I knew it was something important to her. Mm -hmm. So in 2011, I uh, was paying attention right away when I saw Tunisia. I was pretty sure it would spread Egypt. And I was waiting for Syria. Even those first protests in uh, Hawika Square before it really started, mm -hmm. I was looking at it when uh, they were saying Shaba Suri Wahid in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt like uh, that was including me. It was also meant for me. Mm -hmm. When they started asking for a no-fly zone, then uh, this uh, is when I took uh, what I took as a call for action. Mm -hmm. Late 2011, early 2012. This is when I started, as you remember. And that's when uh, I met that's you. That's when we met. That's mm -hmm. when I started to look for ways to get involved directly and uh, to find ways to help the Syrian people. And uh, it's something I've uh, kept through uh, for uh, the past now. six years until now. Until now. You're yeah, still it's, uh, very it's active. It's been a long road, but I think it's important not to give up. Uh, and I think that's one of the messages of the Hanukkah story, mm -hmm. uh, not, not to give up uh, despite the uh, long odds. Uh, if your cause is just, then uh, 
there's always reason to hope and there's always reason to fight on. Mm -hmm. So that's something I think about every year, even uh, with this program, without this program, it's something I think about in this time of year since 2011. And you, you do on yearly, I mean on daily basis, basically, yeah. because that's yeah. what you do. You actively Absolutely. work on this issue. Um, I want to ask you, from. I mean, tell me about your connection to your grandmother. I mean, how did you learn about Syria? What got you interested in Syria? So, uh, my that part of my family went from from Syria to to Venezuela in the mm -hmm. early 1900s, mm -hmm. and e even though my my contact with grandmother, um, you know, given the you know the timing and everything, mm -hmm. um, that was limited mm -hmm. um, but that heritage was always something that we connected to mm -hmm. um, whether through foods mm -hmm. or through expressions you know in Arabic like alamak or something like that mm -hmm. um, and also I, I grew up in Los Angeles where mm -hmm. um, there are many synagogues um, that related to uh, Jewish communities of the Middle East and North Africa Mm -hmm. And one of those being uh, a Syrian synagogue, uh, mm -hmm. which is in Beverly Hills. Uh, and so through a community, uh, there was a certain amount of learning and being able to connect to that part of the, her the heritage and to mm -hmm. share that with, with others. And also, I, I went to school in Boston, mm -hmm. and the, the rabbi is also of Syrian heritage. Um, his family had gone from Syria to, to Egypt and... And that's here in D.C.? I'm um, so in Boston. That's in Boston, sorry, yeah. 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 And um, so one of the things that he helped to instill in us was, um, you know, those of us who were students and had a Syrian background um, included many students who had come from Panama. Mm -hmm. There's a large Syrian Jewish community in Panama as well and to give us a sense of, of what that meant, um, whether through music, um, you know, Makam style music, mm -hmm. or, or the history. Um, and so it's just part of, of the experience and becoming more aware of, of these connections um, you know, that I have personally and being able to appreciate that. And you know, I remember that I would say, you know, this is the, the best thing you could be, is mm -hmm. uh, a Syrian Jew. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a real pride that came with that. And, um, but at the same time, I bet there are so few people who know about that, about that heritage. And through, through the organization, um, Sephardic Heritage International DC or Shin mm -hmm. DC, we're able to raise awareness and to be able to share that with, with people and you know, also through this Hanukkah program, that's a part of why we do it. And so we're able to share that as well, including through the music, mm -hmm. which is uh, an important, Big, part important part of yes. the program. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I do want to ask, like, so is the Jewish Syrian community considered to be Sephardic? Or Mizrahi, I've heard from many people that it's a Sephardic community in Syria because it's Mediterranean. But then others were like, no, there's Mizrahi also. I mean, I, I want to learn more because this is something not everybody probably from our audience are aware of those different distinctions between different denominations or, you know, hmm. ethnic groups. So th there's not consensus on when you sh one should use the term Mizrahi mm -hmm. versus Sephardic. Mm -hmm. um, in its most limited definition, uh, Sephardic refers to the Jews who are from Spain. Mm -hmm. And um, Sephardic um, identity um, was forged in the crucible of Islamic Spain, which was a golden age, um, both for Sephardic Jews and also for for the for Muslims, Spain. yeah, for and Spain, for, yeah. yeah, because yeah, they were together. And so, but later on, um, you know, say more, more recently, the term Mizrahi has come into, into play, to refer to Jewish communities in the Middle East and North Africa, mm -hmm. but 
it's a newer thing and there are positives and negatives We're using the term in terms of how accurate it is, mm -hmm. but certainly the Syrian Jewish community refers to itself as Sephardic. Trying to learn uh, about those distinctions. Okay, yeah. uh, would you like to add anything to this, Shlomo? Yeah, from uh, some people would say that there's communities in some areas that are Sephardic and others that are Mizrahi. Mm -hmm. uh, Mizrahi uh, been there for longer, mm -hmm. uh, at least that's how it was interpreted to me. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's two neighborhoods in Aleppo, uh, uh, I think one in the old city that's considered more Mizrahi and the mm -hmm. other more Sephardic. Mm -hmm. uh, is that correct? Uh, so there's a mixture? Yeah, there's a yeah. mixture. Because it told me like the Iranian, for example, Jewish community is Mizrahi. You know, this is the mm -hmm. whole, like all Mizrahi, uh, this is their uh, so ethnic uh, denomination. I think that's the where the definition um, works best mm -hmm. when you're referring to the Jews of Iran or Iraq. Mm -hmm. But when you begin to talk about some of the other communities, it's, it's, the term is not as useful. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it's Mediterranean, so it's, uh, it's yeah. kind of like they have different... Right. And the, the community in Aleppo um, mm -hmm. was certainly excellent that you have you know, in terms of the program and, you know, what, it, the, what it's based on mm -hmm. um, with the, the Jews who are refugees from Spain after 1492, that these are Sephardic Jews and the original community in, in Aleppo was referred to as Mustarabi. Mm -hmm. And, but when the, the Spanish Jews got there, um, they, they mixed. Mm -hmm. And Today, certainly the, you know, the Jews from Halab refer to, you know, the term that's used for self-reference is, um, is Sephardic. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a Sephardic Heritage Museum in, um, in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and it's mainly um, curates materials related to the, um, the Syrian Jewish community. In, in Sephardic Heritage International, do you see um, you guys told the story of refugees? Uh, you had refugees speaking uh, at your Hanukkah event uh, and such. Uh, how was the response, do you feel, from the Jewish American community? Did you get a lot of interest and um, people wanted to support uh, the cause and, and helping these people more? Fleeing um, violence in Syria. Yes. Um, one of our, our partners in doing this program each year is HIAS. Uh, it's an organization that um, does a lot to, you know, to help to resettle refugees. And they do a lot of outreach to the Jewish community. And so... But we saw what happened to HIAS. I mean, this is the, sh the mass shooting was that's against... That's correct, that there was reference to, yeah. to HIAS. And so it, it takes on... Um, some additional meaning to be able to work with HIAS in this way to, um, you know, they're very supportive refugees also of this program. It was also a way for us to show our support for, for HIAS and what they do, mm -hmm. um, given what was the most brutal attack on you know, the Jewish community in the, in the history of, of this country, mm -hmm. as, as some consider it. And so it's very... And so that's one of the main ways that we're able to, um, <clears throat> to, to reach people in, in the Jewish community. This is something that um, the highest does throughout the year. And um, this year we, um, we did the, the program at Temple Micah. Mm -hmm. And so this also gives us, a, it gave us a way to be able to connect to that community. Mm -hmm. uh, Where is that community, Temple it's, Micah? It's on Wisconsin Avenue in oh, yes. Northwest So DC. this is talking about this year's Hanukkah That's celebration. This year, yeah. yes. yes. And each year, um, the Adas Israel congregation mm -hmm. uh, also uh, works with us um, on this. And mm -hmm. they, they hosted the, the event um, two, two Hanukkahs ago. Mm -hmm. um, and we also wrote of, wrote of Shalom. Um, also works with us on this. And so um, we are able to 
by being able to get this kind of um, you know, support from um, various synagogues and also from Hayas, it, it helps us to be able to do that kind, of, that kind of outreach and to make people more aware of what's going on. And, and like that's what's at the heart of this program, to make people aware of the Syrian refugee crisis and also more aware of ways that they can help. Mm -hmm. And so by coming together with you know, various organizations, um, you know, including um, the people that we um, reach out to on a regular basis, we're able, to, um, you know, we're able to, to work more effectively so that more people are aware of what's going on. Is there uh, any participants in this organization from the Syrian, uh, sorry, the Damascus Jewish community? There's a lot of halab, but is there Damascus? That's what the Shami Jews say. Yeah. <laughs> a lot yeah, of halab, yeah. where's the Damascus? Where's the Damascus? Um, I think it may have something to do with the, the numbers. Yeah. Um, that here in the, in the U.S., I mean, you have um, more halabi than, there are. Uh, than Shami. Mm -hmm. Um, in the U.S. Jews, yeah, in, in, the, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and I think because of the number and um, that, you know, that there is also this feeling, I think, among the, among the Shami Jews. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... So there is that debate. The there debate is, is going on, like, where is the Damascus Jews? Yes. And there's one, you know, Part, as part of our outreach um, in New York, there are some Shami uh, uh, Jews that you know, connect um, with what we're doing, um, and also uh, board members. Um, Leila mm -hmm. um, Levy is, is part Shami Jewish. Uh -huh. so, mm -hmm. so she's part Shami. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so and she, she's yeah, she's taking care of that that angle. Yeah. Yes. Um, in general, do you feel that you were able to reach the Syrian Jewish community in the United States? And that is a question that was asked in, in many uh, different ways about many different issues. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we know that the Assad regime, for example, tried to uh, send delegations to the Syrian Jewish community in uh, New York. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a very tight community. It's very closed off. Uh, mm -hmm. They preserve their identity very well. They don't marry outside. This is what I've heard. I mean, tell me more. What was that, the position, uh, the overall position of the Syrian Jewish community? Because a lot of people wanted to know, were they persuaded by the Assad regime, knowing the horrible history of the Assad family towards Jews in Syria? Yeah. I mean, I kind of, yes. Yeah, yeah, and I then, yeah, from, from both of you, I want to hear this. I don't think they were persuaded, per se. I don't think... Uh, they believe Assad's lies about the uh, Syrian people or about what's going on in Syria. But there is something deeper going on. Uh, most Syrian Jews are not like us, and that's one of the best things uh, that I really appreciated when I uh, first uh, heard about uh, Ephraim's program, the Hanukkah mm -hmm. program, because mm -hmm. he was the president in 2015 of Shin DC mm -hmm. when he invited me to speak. Mm -hmm. It was a much smaller event that year, if you remember. Yes. Uh -huh. Small room, maybe this size. Yes. We didn't have any music, uh -huh. but there was so much energy there. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, part of the main uh, benefits to this program is that it's, uh, it's a reminder that uh, those ties are still there, mm -hmm. that uh, just because uh, we've left Syria, it doesn't mean that Syria's left us. Mm -hmm. Now, for many others in the Syrian Jewish community, it's difficult. Uh, maybe they came more recently. Mm -hmm. Maybe they actually still have traumas uh, from uh, how, how they, they were forced how, out. Yes, how they were forced out, yes. And uh, maybe they still have family there. So mm -hmm. in, some, in some cases, uh, there's been people who say, uh, you know, I support you, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not going to say anything. I have to keep quiet yeah. for the same reason that mm -hmm. uh, many other Syrians That's uh, true. abroad were doing the same. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there's still uh, a Jewish, uh, a small uh, Syrian Jewish community in the heart of the Damascus Old yeah. City. Eighteen uh -huh. elderly. Yeah. Eighteen people. elderly now. They are in Damascus. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. And uh, they're doing fine, thank God, but that's kind of uh, 
in a way, it's uh, the same uh, hostage minority situation, mm -hmm. uh, the same game that Assad has played with the Christians and the Alawites. He also has played it to some extent with the, the Syrian Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, I think, is part of the, uh, part of the problem. But there, there's another aspect with Syrian Jews yes. that's a little different. And this is something that actually I heard from my family early on mm -hmm. in the Syrian revolution. It was another push for me mm -hmm. to get involved, which is that uh, Assad is the reason that the Syrian Jewish community is so small. You know because uh, of uh, your parents, uh, your mother, where yes. she lived. Yes. Many, uh, in Aleppo. Yeah, many in the Jewish in the, quarter in Aleppo. Absolutely. Many in the older generation, they know that the uh, Syrian Jewish communities inside Syria used to be massive. Mm -hmm. Damascus and Aleppo were uh, between a third and a quarter Jewish uh, for decades, if not centuries, uh, until the Assad regime came to power. Mm -hmm. And they uh, justified it by saying we're against Israel. They enacted a systematic persecution of the Syrian Jewish community. When uh, Assad's rule started to become a little in doubt, someone from my family said, uh, you know, you, know, you might have been born in Syria if it weren't for uh, Hafez al-Assad, the Assad regime. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, so they really persecuted the Syrian Jewish community. So. I think there's a skepticism to uh, the Assad regime among Syrian Jews. They know yes. that that's not their friend. So he's not, yeah, he's not their friend. He's yes. not popular. But there's also, because uh, of how he sort of justified his oppression, uh, Arab nationalism and saying, you know, we're uh, with the Arabs, this is the people, we're like fighting Zionism. Uh, there's also a uh, sort of fear of the Syrian population. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, unfortunately, and even for those who have left, uh, Assad managed, before they left, to divide them from the rest of uh, yes. the Syrian population. Plant fear. Plant and fear suspicion. and so mistrust. And this mm -hmm. is a recurring problem we've seen in And that Syria. we've seen between every yeah. segment of every society. Every segment, for, in not even religion. That's so true. Damascus and Halab, yes. uh, different regions, yes. rural and urban. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is part of Assad's strategy. And uh, unfortunately, it, I think it did partly work and it partly failed. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's why we see the, you know, the, the community being abstaining from uh, yeah. getting involved in a massive, more uh, outspoken way. What would you answer this, uh, from, from your angle, about the Syrian Jewish community in the United States? Uh, I, you know, like Shlomo said, you know, there were, the community pretty much ended as, in Syria ended as a viable community in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, at first, well, you know, there was persecution, and um, by by Hafez al-Assad, and mm -hmm. they weren't being allowed to leave. And then finally, they were allowed to to leave, and some say it because he wanted more leverage in terms of making peace with Israel, mm -hmm. and so he allowed the rest. Of, you know the community to leave, and many came here to um, you know to the U.S. and and so even though some who left earlier, I think would have had a, a more um, well, a more pleasant memory mm -hmm. of leaving. That those who left more recently, it's it's very negative, mm -hmm. um, and you know they don't remember it in a nice way, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, they suffered more. Right. So he basically like held them hostages, terrorized them, and then he was like, "Okay, now you can go." So they can like not remember it in yeah. a positive light. Mm -hmm. yeah. And today, that's why we have the the last chief rabbi of Damascus um, lives in in Holon, mm -hmm. Israel. He takes care of you know uh, Syrian Jews who who live there to to build up the heritage you know, from a religious perspective. Um, uh, where is he right now? In in Holon, Israel. Oh, okay, Hello, yeah. Israel, yes. And where there is a large uh, Syrian, Syrian Jewish, Jewish community. Yes. community. And, and it's all together now, 130,000. Um, mm -hmm. And 
now 75, about 75,000 Syrian Jews who live in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so... So 135 in Israel in 75 here? Right, 130,000 in Israel, in 75,000 here in the yes, U.S. in the U.S. And, mm -hmm. you know, in some smaller numbers throughout Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as right. I said, it's, there's sort of a more, more, more recent memory, which is not pleasant, and I think that people coming out of that often they just they want to be able to move on with their yes. lives mm -hmm. and um, take care of their families and focus on on those types of things oh so you had somebody from Aleppo came, came all the way to see uh, the program right I think part of her her family yeah. she's like oh she's part um, you know part Halabi mm -hmm. and um, she when she heard that we were doing this um, you know she came all the way from Florida Mm -hmm. um, to participate, and we had a we did a coat and blanket drive um, for is, we worked with the um, Nova Relief Center mm -hmm. to do a coat and blanket um, drive for Syrian refugees who are in refugee camps in Jordan. I believe there are about 120,000 mm -hmm. in in those camps, and so she came all the way from Florida with um, you know with coats. Mm -hmm. To be able to um, to be able to 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 help to do something, mm -hmm. and and that's part of what makes you know it's an important part of this program is that we want people to know all the, the different things that they can do to help, and uh, and so it was very you know special to be able to have that um, you know very practical um, item that people could do, and so. Is that so? We get we get that, but then again, you know, we're not at the epicenter of you know Syrian Jewish community, which is mainly yet. in, not in New York. Not yet. And There's so a lot of love to Halab. I, I just hear a lot of love. There Halab, is specifically Aleppo. It is. There is. Yeah. There is a lot of love. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been told by a friend of mine that. Uh, Jews from Aleppo would not marry uh, Jews from Damascus and vice versa. Is that true? true. Is that how, how you know, live, completely loyal they are to the cities? Sometimes when they, when they moved from Syria, mm -hmm. they would establish different neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Aleppo versus the Damascus? The, the Damascus neighborhoods. Is really? You know, like, for example, <laughs> in Argentina, where you had a, a large um, Syrian Jewish community, uh, you know, community. community yeah. You had a separate neighborhood for for you know for Halabis and a sec separate neighborhood for Shamis, uh -huh. and the same thing in Mexico City. Yeah, and, and they don't mix. It, it happens. I mean, mixing always you know, but for the most part, it was most people that so attached to that identity, uh -huh. which which I think is amazing after a, you know for some people being out of Syria for decades, decades, yeah. Mm -hmm. And for some, I, you know, our third, I think even the fourth generation, mm -hmm. um, you know, say, take for example, is Jerry Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. Many people know his mother is Syrian. Yes. But he's third generation. Mm -hmm. And his uh, grandparents were Salim and Salha Hosni from, mm -hmm. were also from Halab. Also from Aleppo, yeah. Yeah. And so, it, and so it's so interesting that after all this time, that you know the identity is so strong, and it's not just Syrian, but it's you know it's uh, Halabi it's or it's like Shami. more specific. Correct. But that mirrors. I mean, I, I think this is important for our <coughs> audience to hear, just because it mirrors uh, the, the entire Syrian society. Because there's a lot of that, you know, Aleppo oh, yeah. is versus Damascus. You know, there is that rivalry, <laughs> let's say, between different cities. So it's it's important for people to realize that it's also include right. the Syrian Jewish community. And I think what you'll hear is, you know, people from the Shami community might say, well, you know, we're, we're also the, we're the best, but there's, all, yeah, there's so yeah. much attention on the, on the Halabi yeah. Jewish community. <laughs> so for, for any Halabi, for any Shami Jews listening, there's a shout out to the Shamis. Yeah, shout um, out to the Shamis yeah. and, and uh, you know, kind of, I would love to see more, you know, uh, you guys uh, working with uh, with more people from yeah. the Damascus uh, Jewish community. We, we like Shamis. We're a fan of Shamis. <laughs> We're a fan of Shamis. That's yeah. cool. Since your grandmothers both are from Aleppo, yeah. um, I want to ask you, Shlomo. Did you feel or see witness uh, in your activism uh, that there are a lot of uh, Jewish American uh, organizations who kind of helped 
in uh, the you know the requests and the asks of the Syrian people from the American administration, was their participation basically on the side of the Syrian revolution and the, what people were asking for from the administration, the previous one and the current one? I Generally think uh, definitely there are, and mm -hmm. uh, is it many? Is it the majority? I, I definitely yes. I think it is the majority. I think uh, there's a general understanding uh, among most of the major Jewish organizations, including the pro-Israel organizations, mm -hmm. by the way, yes, that uh, they support uh, the Syrian, including uh, APAC including APAC, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, some of the smaller groups connected mm -hmm. to APAC. There's uh, one group uh, actually that's local to here uh, called Emmett, and uh, mm -hmm. the president of that said, uh, you know, in 2011, I stopped everything. I was lobbying for the Free Syrian Army. Uh, it's a pro, and she, she leads a pro-Israel organization. That's her day job. Mm -hmm. uh, so. So she became pro Syrian, uh, free Syrian army. Yeah. Yeah. So th and Emmet is right wing. Yeah, Emmet is right wing. People need to know uh, that. Yeah, Emmet yeah. is a right wing uh, yeah, Jewish right -wing organization. Jewish. Yeah, definitely. They characterize themselves, I think, as a uh, right of center. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me. And they were completely pro the Syrian revolution since the beginning. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. they've been supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but. All of them, they started to have some doubts. Uh, you know, the whole issue of Islamic extremism uh, within the opposition. Which happened slowly under the Obama administration's watch. Yes, uh, 2012, they were all supportive. Uh, mm -hmm. They were all cheering. 2013, 2014, they start to uh, have their doubts a little mm -hmm. more. Uh, but still, in spite of that, I think even today, if uh, uh, like they feel like they, they, they have this sort of idea that they don't want to take sides, mm -hmm. uh, to me, I don't understand that because mm -hmm. they all would say, you know, we're against chemical weapons. <laughs> they yes. all would say. And then they would support something like the Caesar's bill, which is yeah. sanctioning the Assad regime, uh, very tough sanctions. Yes, so they, they support they the sanctions. They still support that, yes. Yeah, they clearly support the sanctions bills Mm -hmm. uh, and the things that are, uh, in a sense, easier to do, uh, you'll see them still doing that mm -hmm. and still pushing uh, pretty hard mm -hmm. as they can. Uh, so in that sense, uh, yes, I think uh, groups such as Hyas, mm -hmm. uh, groups such as, uh, and it needs to be said, many of the uh, uh, organizations who work on refugees are not uh, the best when it comes to... Uh, understanding the broader Syrian conflict mm -hmm. and what made them So they them only refugees. focus on the humanitarian refugee aspects. Yes. There's mm -hmm. even some organizations that I know they're calling for, uh, they're very supportive of refugees, they're involved in humanitarian aid, and they oppose a no-fly zone for Syrians, mm -hmm. which uh, is causing the problem. Uh, the Assad regime air raid is the main problem. Mm -hmm. So groups such as Hayas, they get it. They understand. I went to an event, a community roundtable uh, or a community gathering two years ago. Mm -hmm. They had uh, uh, like a whole family from Aleppo. They were uh, very passionately speaking against Assad. Mm -hmm. So they get it. They, they get it, highest. Yeah, they get it. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's a shame that they were targeted. I feel like in a way, this is partly why they were targeted. Yes, I mean, the guy posted that. Uh, the, yeah. the attacker, when he attacked the synagogue, he posted that on, yeah. uh, I'm not sure which social media. Uh, yeah, the, the, and, uh, right. so, so I think there's a general support, uh, even from APAC, mm -hmm. uh, there, there is that measured support from the pro-Israel groups. Mm -hmm. They understand there's potential for an alliance here. Mm -hmm. They would like to see the opposition be kind of uh, more moderate and secular, mm -hmm. which... Uh, we both understand uh, mm -hmm. why it's easier said than done, and uh, you know it's not a matter of waving the wand. There, there's real reasons it turned out the way it did. Uh, but so, so that mainly region, regional players. Yeah, regional players. Uh, mm -hmm. Other regional players uh, did not want to see that happen and that model continue as it did in 2012 or 13. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
Israel had the attitude that we don't want to be involved, yes or no, we want to be neutral. Yeah. So most of these groups who consider themselves pro-Israel, I think that kind of tempered them, mm -hmm. that they that wanted position. to support, uh, but then they sort of didn't want to go too far mm -hmm. because then, uh, you know, they're going much further than Israel. Yes. Uh, and one actually said to me at this point, someone who's uh, left APAC at one point said this to me, that, uh, you know, we don't want to be ahead of Israel on mm -hmm. this issue. Yes. So that is part of it. Exactly. Uh, but I think there is a general support. Uh, I have felt that. What about the Holocaust Museum? Because we saw many different exhibitions and stuff. And right. is there a way, I mean, you know, your, your sense of the Holocaust kind of museum, how they have uh, handled the Syria situation, but also is there going to be collaboration between you guys in the Holocaust Museum in the future? Uh, so just to add a little something to some of that Shlomo said and to transition into that, mm -hmm. um, it was Hayas brought, um, who brought thousands of Syrian Jews and helped them to resettle in, in New York in, in, the, in the 90s. And so another reason, you know, yeah. another source of gratitude for them. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, the, the chief, it was the chief rabbi of Israel, uh, I, um, Yitzhak Yosef, mm -hmm. who called the you know, situation with the conflict in Syria a, a small holocaust. Mm -hmm. And it, it's also, he's the one who said Which that. Which some people are sensitive about that, uh, you know, in the Israeli community and in the Jewish American community, because they, Absolutely. you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a big statement, yes. let's and he, say. And he also said that as Jews, we cannot be silent as mm -hmm. people were um, when, you know, when Jews experienced, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Holocaust. And so it's, I think it's, it, it, it's, it's helpful to, to be able to have, um, you know, the chief Sephardic rabbi in, in Israel to, to say that um, because it, you know, it, it helps to be able to get um, more support in, in, in the Jewish community. And, you know, I, I think you don't need the um, to look at the Holocaust to see how horrific um, the situation is in Syria, um, but it it's but it's also I, you know we share this feeling um, with um, Rabbi Yitzchak Yosef, whose mother is um, is Shami. Is Shami from the okay. from the Fatal yeah, family? Somebody is Shami. So there's Shami. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. So yeah, yeah, so he's half Shami, and yeah. and and he, you know, and he spoke out in support and saying we can't be silent about you know the small Holocaust that's mm -hmm. going on in, in Syria, and in in terms of the the, the Holocaust Museum, um, we work with them on, on a number of things. Mm -hmm. um, we did something on Greek Jews and the Holocaust with um, in partnership with the Holocaust, you know, United States um, Holocaust Memorial Museum um, at the Greek Embassy um, November of last year. Mm -hmm. And we, we focused on, uh, you know, Sephardic um, narratives of the Holocaust. And we're actually we're doing a, a program on the Hill um, in, on January 31st. Um, we're going to be in the, um, the Gold Room of the House of Representatives and uh, one of our speakers is, is going to be from the Holocaust Museum. Mm -hmm. And so we have been, been collaborating. Working, collaborating on you know, a number of, number of programs. And, um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of work that we're looking forward to doing with them. Perfect. Uh, Shlomo, just before we end, because we only have like, very limited time left, I just wanted yeah. to ask you about the perception and, and how uh, were you uh, basically uh, embraced by the Syrian uh, American community in general. And what type of interaction have you experienced uh, for, you know, during the last seven years now, working on the Syria issue and meeting all types of people? There's the religious yeah. Muslim, there's the secular. How were you, how was your interaction in general? This, is, uh, this has been uh, for sure one of the most uh, rewarding parts of uh, working on Syria for me personally. Uh, and uh, a lot of it is uh, not so rewarding. A lot of it is very difficult uh, mm -hmm. to watch what's going on uh, very close, uh, sometimes working on specific cases even. Uh, it can be very difficult. Uh, heartbreaking. But, uh, yeah, heartbreaking. Yeah. Uh, but uh, getting to know the people 
I was uh, recently talking to a Syrian American friend who said, oh, what does the Syrian identity mean now where so many of us are displaced, our country is practically destroyed, uh, what does it mean to be a Syrian in this day and age? And my answer to him was, uh, the people that I met uh, when working for the right cause, uh, the friendships that were made, this to me is uh, something that will continue uh, throughout the uh, ages. Uh, and I have been uh, privileged to meet friends who were very secular, friends who were very religious uh, mm -hmm. in, in, among the Syrian Americans. Uh, and among the Syrians, I met people who, uh, who were just non came. Yeah, who just came here. Yeah, from uh, Syria. I met people who, uh, who fought. I met people who uh, were nonviolent. Mm -hmm. I met people who uh, didn't think there should ever be violence. Uh, I met people who were very supportive. So the whole frame of the political spectrum, uh, it's been a real privilege to meet them and to get to know them, even the ones that I disagree with. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know there's always back and forth, but of even course. the ones I disagree with, I admire really the work that they're doing uh, in such tough circumstances uh, that it's hard to even imagine, even for those who uh, maybe they aren't directly affected, uh, but they have a family member who is, or so many people they know, friends who are, Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to imagine what they're going through, and the way they're able to push through that is uh, really remarkable. So I think, uh, yeah, it, it's been a great privilege. And this is something that I've also been thinking about more recently. Uh, this time uh, of year, as I said, I often think about Hanukkah. My mm -hmm. wife said to me this year, uh, it's different this time. We know uh, Assad's not going to be overthrown, at least not for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's not the hope that there was. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is also, in a way, part of the Hanukkah story that many people don't know. Uh, the Hanukkah story, the Greeks were trying to oppress the Jews. Uh, the Maccabees, uh, this like band of rebels, rose up and they managed to gain their freedom. But really, only for a little while. Uh, eventually, uh, the Jews were uh, forced out. Eventually, the Jews were subjugated. So what's the point of the holiday? You still remember, even though uh, you didn't get a total success, even though it wasn't the end of the story. It was story. by the Romans, right? The, yeah, by yeah. the Greeks, by uh, the Greeks. It was taken out again by the Greeks, not the Romans? The, the Greeks and then the Romans. And then the Romans, yeah. Uh, but you still remember uh, hope. the hope that you felt then, you still remember that it's possible. And those, uh, those lights are what carry us through the dark times. So that's something to think about, you know, even though Aleppo is not there, uh, all the great things that were built in Aleppo uh, in ancient history that were destroyed physically, and also the freedom that was built there, the free institutions that were built, even though they're gone in Halab, they're gone in Ghuta, they're gone in Dara. It doesn't mean that it's the end of the story. It's still a memory that will carry forward. It's still a source of inspiration in dark times. So this is uh, what I would say is the revised lesson of Hanukkah that uh, can be taught, uh, can be generalized for anyone, uh, for all Syrians facing uh, these troubled times, that uh, it doesn't end and the hope continues. Uh, even though you light the eighth night of the candles and the candles go out, you still remember and it's still a source of hope for you. Yes. So I hope it will be the same uh, for the Syrian people who are displaced from their land. Um, so I just wanted to, to add to that that Hanukkah is really a time of hope and you said this extra flame that we light um, that inspired the program that we do each year is about um, it, it represents safety or security and tolerance, which is something that refugees still need today. Um, mm -hmm. Regard, you know, wherever wherever you are, that because um, this is something that we all need as human beings, and so you know we 
you know, want, you know, we, we have compassion and we, and really we need that extra flame. We need mm -hmm. that light in the world today. And it's so important to, to not give up hope. And it's also something that this, you know, this, this annual Hanukkah program represents. Thank you so much. Beautiful words, uh, beautiful work. Uh, I really salute you guys and I'd love to have you again in the future. Thank it's been you. a real pleasure. Thank you. That was it for tonight's episode. Thank you for watching us. Good night.